Father, as we study your word now, teach our hearts. Help us to learn from Jonah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. See, Jonah. Jonah is a prophet in the uh, Old uh, Testament. And I've t- I titled our message this morning, Jonah the Reluctant Prophet. The Reluctant Prophet. Uh, and, and in this series, what we're going to see, we're going to see God's unfailing love for us. So God, you will get to see God's unfailing love for you and for all people in the world. So Jonah only has uh, four chapters, so that will take us to uh, the end uh, of the year. Uh, each week, we will be looking at one chapter in the book of Jonah. And today, we're going to look at uh, chapter one of Jonah. So we're going to look at chapter one in the book of Jonah. So the book of Jonah is what you call a minor prophet, minor prophet. Uh, Minor prophet does not mean that they have a little message. Uh, It just means that the book is small. Okay, Jonah only has four chapters, what you call the major prophets like Ezekiel, those have like, what, 37 chapters, uh, where you have the uh, other ones like Daniel has like 12 chapters, but Jonah, uh, we just call it like a minor prophet because uh, it's, it's very, those books tend to be very small. And in Jonah, what we are going to see is uh, that God's love, God's love for everyone. Uh, what we're going to see in the book of Jonah is that we will see that God loves everyone. Uh, the book of Jonah is a book about God's will, about God's will, uh, and how we respond to God's will. It's also about the love of God and how we share it with others. So we're going to be talking about God's will, we're going to talk about God's love, how we respond to God's love, and how we share God's love with others. So let's start. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. So the book starts with the prophet Jonah running away from God. So Jonah runs from the Lord. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. And get up. And go to the great city of Nineveh, announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction, to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship living for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. So the book starts with a preacher running away from God. Isn't that fun? You see a preacher, God is asking him to do something, but he refused to. See, we're not talking about, you know, just, just, just you, you know, anybody here. We're talking about somebody was supposed to know better. Somebody was supposed to know God's word. But God clearly calling Jonah, but Jonah says no. God says go. Jonah says no. See, to give you a picture uh, where Tarshish is, as you can see on the left there, and, and, and Nineveh is all the way up there. So God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. So you see Joppa there on the map at the bottom left. So instead of going to Nineveh, he went as far away as he could. He was supposed to go up to Nineveh, but he decided to go down Uh, from Joppa and go down to Tarshish. So Jonah, the reluctant prophet. And what we're going to see this morning is that we cannot run away from God. Have you ever realized that? 
We cannot run away from God. God says, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. See, Nineveh was a very wicked city. Those people were known to treat their prisoners of war very badly. They will take their prisoners of wars, they would kill them, and they will lay them out on the street. They would take their bodies, pile them up, let them dry on the streets so people can see what they have done. So that no other countries would even think about coming to attack them. See, Nineveh was the capital, in about 8 B.C. 700, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. And Assyria was a great empire at at the time. And they were ruthless. So maybe Jonah had a point there. Jonah did not want to go. Probably Jonah was scared. But we will see in chapter 4 the true motivation for why Jonah did not go. See, probably here, uh, those people, they were scared. Uh, Jonah may uh, be, you know, those wicked people, probably they're going to kill me. Those people were also uh, worshipped the other gods. They worshipped idols. So for whatever reason, Jonah did not want to go. But in chapter 4, it tells us that Jonah did not want to go because Jonah did not want the people to be saved. Jonah did not like them. But when God calls you to do something, whether you like God's plan or not, God is calling us to do what? To do it. God is calling us to be obedient. But here Jonah thinks that he knows better than God. God says to go, but Jonah says no. And that's never a good thing. You see, whenever there's a problem, God will raise up someone to address it. If it is you, will you answer the call or are you going to flee? That's my question for us this morning. Whenever there's a problem, God will raise up somebody to address it. Are you going to rise up and answer the call? Or are you going to flee like Jonah? Jonah thinks that he knew better than God. God gave him a mission, but, God, but Jonah didn't think that was a good plan. You see, whenever we fail to answer the call, it is because of a lack of love for God and for people. Notice here, Nineveh was a wicked city, as I told you. But who took the initiative to restore those people? Come on, wake up. Who took the initiative? God did. Did you see the Ninevites calling out to God? See, that's why the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, God died for us. See, God always takes the initiative. Even when we're not working with God, God is still thinking about us. This is crazy love. You see the song that says reckless love? God's love is really reckless. The Ninevites, as wicked as they were, but God took the initiative. God called his prophet Jonah and says, go. Preach to those people because I love them too. Because God says, I created them too. God is saying, they are mine too. See, that's why that we got to love everybody. It doesn't matter what they've done to us, but God says we got to love some people. We have to love Everyone, because that's what God does. God initiates. Remember, God is the source of love. God initiates love. God goes after those who do not care for him. Remember, God is the God who goes after the one, leaving the 99 so that God can rescue that last one. You see, God 
God's love we will never fully understand. God loved the Ninevites as much as he loved the Jewish people, as much as he loved Jonah. And in verse 3, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of God. How foolish. Can we get away from the presence of God? So he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. See, many times you see away from the presence of the Lord. And it's the crazy thing. He had to pay the share too. (laughs) He had to pay the fare. And he was just going down away from what God calls him to do. See, the lesson is only a fool thinks he can get away from God. Only a fool thinks he can get away from God. Because God is where? Everywhere. God is omniscient. He's omnipresent. God knows everything and he is everywhere. Look at Psalm 139. Read it with me. It says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your... Jonah was a preacher, right? Do you think that Jonah knows Psalm 139? But for some reason, Jonah forgot. If I ascend to heaven, you are right there. If I make my bed in in Sheol, you are right there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall Hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. You know that God does everything you do in the dark? That's a scary thought. Right? That's a very scary thought. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is how? (laughs) As bright as the day. When it's night, it is clearly wide open to God. The night is as bright as the day. For darkness is as light to you. (laughs) So you know like there's no secret with God? See, that's why when you go before God, you can go on a shame and you can be naked and, on, and open to God. You, you, you tell him everything that's in your heart because he already knows it all. There's not one thing that God does not know about you. So when you go to God in prayer, you can be fully and completely honest to him and none of us can run from God verse 4 but the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break remember that God is everywhere and God is all-powerful Not only God is omnipresent, but God is omnipotent. He can do everything. So you're running away. What does God do? Let me bring some bad circumstances in your life. Let me bring a storm in your life. So God hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break. See, for some of us, the storms in our lives are because of our sins. We know clearly it's not every storm in our life, because remember Job? Did Job do anything? Nothing. But did Jonah do something? Because of Jonah's action, now God sent out a storm. You see, when we think we're running away from God, we're just calling out problems upon ourselves. 
Anytime we're running away from God, we're just calling for problems upon our life. You see, everyone and everything are at God's disposal. You know that the wind is at God's disposal? The sea is at God's disposal? Even that ship was at God's disposal? Everyone and everything are at God's disposal, and that's why it is so foolish to go against him. You cannot go against God. Remember what, what God said to Paul in the book of Acts? When, when Paul was going around, Saul at the time, before he became Paul, was persecuting all the believers, God says, you cannot kick against the goads. You know what that means? It's like, it's like a horse, you know, like with that thing they put on the horse. When the horse tried to fight, you're just pulling that. See, God says, you're just hurting yourself anytime you're running away from me. God is saying, anytime you're being disobedient, guess what? You are hurting yourself. Just like when the horse is trying to go wrong way, what do you do? Keep pulling that. And that goat keeps hitting them. It's, it's kind of like you have to inflict pain in order to make the horse do what it's supposed to be. So God is saying to us, don't be like a horse, be obedient. Be like a horse that, is, uh, that has been trained and just do what God tells you to do so that it doesn't have to pull the, that thing to hurt you. So Paul said, God said to Saul, you can't kick against the goats. Everyone and everything are at God's disposal and that's why it is so foolish to go against God. In the end, you will lose. Do you know that God always wins? God always wins. Any of you have other ideas? God always wins. Look at verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid. Do you know that your sins affect other people? What did those people do? Jonah brought that problem on the ship, as we will see later. And each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten uh, it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner parts of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the very storm that was designed for Jonah to get his attention, had no effect in his life. The very storm that God sent to get his attention had no effect in his life. While everybody was scared, he created a situation where everybody was trying to do something about it, but Jonah went to sleep. Jonah went to sleep. You see, it's amazing how some of us sleep through the very storms that God have, that has been, that have been designed just for us to wake us up so that we would turn from our ways. Have you seen more people turn to God from COVID? Or people just become worse? God created a situation so that we'll, we'll see like only God could do such a thing. That only God has such power. All people, all the nations, with all their powers, nobody can control it. Everything had to shut down. But instead of people running to God now, oh, I'm doing life all by myself. I'm just doing my own thing. See, people get worse. Instead of running to God, we get worse. We just keep running because we know better. See, the very storm that God designed to get Jonah's attention had no effect. Jonah went to sleep. That's how stubborn that we can be. When we decide to do whatever we want to do. And this is not the way to live. In verse 6, it says, So the captain came and said to him, What are you, what do you mean, you sleeper? 
Like, are you kidding me? That's what the captain is saying there in, in the JFB version. That's the Jose Fred Breville's Bible translation. You got it? Okay. Are you kidding me? It says, arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. Isn't it fun when you're being rebuked by unbelievers? Have you ever been rebuked by an unbeliever? It's shameful. Because unbelievers know how you're supposed to act. Unbelievers know how you're supposed to behave. They may not like your God. They may not come to church. But they know exactly how Christians are supposed to behave. And when we go out, when we go so far out, some of them will rebuke us. That's amazing that the people that God used to rebuke us, just like God used the captain right here to rebuke Jonah. It's like, Really, pal? You sleeping? Come on, man. You must be kidding me. See, it's not fun when we're being rebuked by an unbeliever. And you see, desperate situation called for desperate measures. The captain and the crew, they were willing to do Try anything with no certainty of getting positive results. You see, that's the thing with all other gods. They have no certainty that their God will answer. You see, you see the captain says, oh, maybe your God will answer. It's kind of like ready to try anything in this situation. And who caused all that commotion? Jonah. But he didn't care one bit. So our choices affect others. We need to be careful. Our sin affect other, other people. While we don't care, but people are being affected. And in verse 7 it says, And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots. That was a common practice. That's like towing dice. That we may know uh, on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on who? Jonah, then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? So people says, man, you've done something really bad. What did you do? What did you do? And then I love that Jonah never answered that question. When they say, what is your occupation? Jonah never answered that question. Look, look at Jonah's uh, response in verse 9. And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. He said where he's from. He says, uh, what, what, who are his people? How are the Hebrew people? And I fear the Lord. He, says, he talks about his God, the God of heaven who made the, the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid. So if he says, his God makes the sea and now you are at sea, that means the sea subjects to that God. So the men were exceedingly afraid. You see, that's why sometimes you got to be careful what you wear, you know? Remember I shared with you when I was wearing a church t-shirt, but I was not as kind as I should be? See, you got to be careful. Just the same thing, like when you find yourself in compromising situation, you may not want to say what you do. See? It's kind of like, um, uh, I, I, know, I, I know a pastor, he says, you know, when, when he gets in the airplane, he doesn't like to say he's a pastor. He'll tell people he's a writer, you know, he's an author, he's... See, all this, because people already have their expectations so high. <laughs> See, Jonah here is messing up, and Jonah could not say what he did. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is it that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. You see, we need to be careful 
Running away from God is not a solution. And people who do not know God knows what we're supposed to be doing. You know it's bad and gone too far when even non-believers know that we should do better. See, when you see a non-believer rebuke you, you can be sure that you've gone really far. So we got to be careful. We got to listen, not only to fellow believers, but when somebody was an unbeliever, they know us and see how messed up that we have become. And when they are rebuking us, that means that we are really out of it. It's really bad. We've gone too far when non-believers know what we should do. Verse 11, then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. Who is the God of the sea? See, for, and he said to them, pick me up, hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon me. Jonah rather commits suicide than to do what God has called him to do. Jonah could have said, turn the ship around and head to Nineveh. All of it will stop, right? Jonah could have prayed and said, God, forgive me. Once the boat lands, I am going to take another boat and head back to Nineveh where you want me to go, right? That's how far that we can have gone. See, when we go far from the presence of the Lord, our mind is so messed up, we will do anything. See, Jonah here rather commits suicide than to be obedient to God's word. God says to go to Nineveh, but Jonah says no. And Jonah is still unwilling to do what God tells him while the sea listens to God, while the boat is subjected to God, while the wind listens to God, but the preacher would not. That's how far we can go. It's amazing how we refuse to repent despite our knowledge of the word of God on a particular matter. We'd rather be damned. See, a lot of us are just like Jonah. We know what God calls us to do, but we refuse to do it. Jonah would rather die than to see the Ninevites get saved. Verse 13, nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. What does that tell us? When we're running out of a God, away from God, we can get out of it. If you want to get out of it, you better turn to God. Only God can get you out of the mess you created once you run away from him. See, the man tried hard to save Jonah, but they were unsuccessful. Therefore, they called out to the Lord. Now, you know that we cannot mess up God's plan. Even in our own willingness, God can still use that to save people. Look at this. Who are they praying to now? Are they still praying to their false gods? You see, O Lord, in, 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 in capital letters, it says, therefore they called out to the Lord. That's Jonah's God. That's the God of God, the Lord of Lords. O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done it as done as it please you. So now they're, getting, they're gaining faith in the true God. You see, when we think we're running away from God, God's agenda remains intact. His agenda is to make disciples wherever we go. While Jonah refused to make disciples in Nineveh, guess what he was doing? Making disciples while he was being disobedient on his way to Tarshish. 
You want to fight God? Have fun. You're just trying to inflict pain on yourself. But God's plan will remain intact. God's purpose is still going to go as planned. You see, the story we hear in Jonah also is, is when we see when unbelievers are more righteous than believers. Did you see that? Oh, do I need to read the text to you again? Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, and they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous. So they were doing whatever it takes to save Jonah. Jonah told them what the solution was, kill him. But no, they did whatever they could to save Jonah. That's when non-believers puts us to shame. When they are acting more righteous than we do. And that's what we see here in this story. And this continues to happen today. When you will meet somebody who is not a believer, but they're acting better than Christians. When unbelievers are more righteous than believers, see, they did not want him to die. They did not want to be murderers. They did not want to have his blood upon themselves. See, when God's judgment is upon us, no one will be able to help us despite their best efforts. Let's ponder on this one. When God's judgment is upon us, no one will be able to help us despite their best efforts. We cannot run away from God. If we're running away from God now for whatever that God is calling us to do, whatever we see clearly in his word and not doing, the consequences are great. Because when God's judgment comes, no one will be able to help you even your grandmother <laughs> I know you'll think that grandmothers are superheroes right <laughs> but you see when God's judgment is upon you no one can help you because you have to face God now because you were the one being disobedient got it all right let's wrap it up Verse 15, so they picked him up uh, and hurled him to the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Jonah knew what he was talking about, right? But there were other ways, but Jonah chose the suicide route because Jonah's heart was hard for the people of Nineveh. He did not want them to be saved. And he just wanted to be disobedient till the end. Just like some people tell you, I will never forgive that person until I'm six foot under. You ever heard people say that? Some people will go down to the ground and not forgive. Or they're being directly disobedient to what God I called them to do because God says we need to forgive. So they picked him up, they threw him, and, this, and it stopped. See, the wind listens to God. The sea listens to God. Every creature listens to God except us. But we refuse to listen to God. Then the man feared the Lord. How? <laughs> you got to love God. God has a sense of humor. Doesn't he? Remember I told you God's plan will always come to pass? It doesn't matter how you messed up, how, how you just messed it up. God's plan will always come to pass. His plan is to save as many as possible. His plan is for us to make disciples. His plan is to save that which was lost. Jonah didn't go save those people in Nineveh. In his disobedience, God used it. To save the people on the ship. You got to love God. Then the man feared the Lord. How? Say it with me. Exceedingly. That's the highest level you can get. 
and they offered a sacrifice. Oh, they're making sacrifice. Hey, I'm coming to church. <laughs> they're making sacrifice. I'm giving. They're making sacrifice now because now they're becoming obedient. They offer the sacrifice to the Lord and make vows. So they're making commitments. Hey, God, I'm going to be committed to you. We live in a world now where none of us wants to make any kind of commitment. They just received God, right? How long is that? Were they Christians for 50 years? Were they Christians all their lives? They started making commitment to God the moment they received Christ. See, they feared God exceedingly. That means they, they really took God seriously. And the problem we have today, a lot of us don't take God seriously. God says, do this, but we're going to go the way of Jonah. We're going to do our own thing. But they feared God exceedingly. That means they took God seriously. They offered sacrifice. That means they started doing the things that they needed to do. They were loving God sacrificially just like God loved them sacrificially. And they were making vows. They were making commitment to God. Those sailors put us Christians today to shame. Where we might have been walking with God. We might say we're Christian for the longest, but we don't take God seriously. We don't fear God. If we fear God, we would do what God says to do. Right? Uh, if we fear God, we will, we will sacrificially do the things that God tells us to do, whether we like it or not. Wouldn't we? And we would make commitment to God about the things that God asks us to do. We want to do what God tells us to do. And then verse 17 ends there. It says, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I wonder how it feels to be in the, uh, inside a fish. Man. Wow. I should actually come and teach me. It's going to be pretty smelly. God appointed a great fish. Remember fish? You know, somehow, it doesn't matter how they clean it, there's always a little smell to it. Am I grossing you out yet? Yeah. That yuck stuff. All right, let's move on. Okay. But God appointed a great fish. You see, because of this here, verse 17, a lot of people see Jonah as an allegorical story. But it is not. In the Old Testament, in the book of Kings, uh, the Bible referred to Jonah as an actual prophet. And Jesus referred to Jonah as an actual prophet, didn't he? It says, just like Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, even so the men of men will... Remember that? See, so this is no allegorical allegorical story this is a real story real events that actually happen now simple what does genesis 1 1 says in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth do you believe this yeah. so if god created the heavens and the earth and he created all the animals he created us he created everything can god create a big fish that can swallow people that's it so this is a true story, okay? This is no fable. This is, this, this is a real story, real thing that happened. It says, God appointed a great fish and swallow up Jonah. You see, we don't have to go as far away from God like that so that God, God has to appoint a fish to take us, giving us like an unpleasant experience. But God can do. See, verse 15, the problem that was causing their trouble was spiritual in nature. And the same is true for some of our problems. For some problems, we need a spiritual solutions. See, that's why the Bible says, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Okay? So that means when you get your trouble, not all your troubles now, okay? Remember, remember Job. Not all your troubles are consequences of sin. 
But many of your troubles are a consequence of sin. They are spiritual issues. And you need to take a good look to really think, examine yourself. You see, even, was it Socrates or Plato that says, the unexamined life is not worth living? Uh, Corinthians, uh, First Corinthians asks us to do the same thing also. We need to examine ourselves and see whether we are in the faith or not. See, we need to examine ourselves and look at the problems in our lives. Is it because of sin? Okay? Is it because of something that we are doing that is causing that issue into our life? Especially if we see the problems keep repeating, it keeps recycled over and over. That means God is trying to teach us something that we've never learned. This is how God's work. When things go in cycle, it's like the same thing keeps happening and happening and happening and happening and happening and happening. We never break free from it. This is a spiritual stronghold. That's what the Bible calls spiritual stronghold. So pay attention. If it's the same thing over and over, it might be a spiritual issue. And when you have a spiritual issue, it calls for prayer and fasting. And then a call for you to become obedient to what God calls you to do. But again, remember, are all problems a result of sin? No. Anytime that comes to your mind, remember Job. Okay? But a lot of our problems are because just we act like Jonah. Okay? Because we don't do what God calls us to do. See, God is still sovereign despite our disobedience. He will accomplish his purpose with or without us. God accomplishes his purpose still. Okay? He will do it with or without us. So when you keep running, God will make it very unpleasant for you. That's the last lesson from the text. Uh, but I have some... Uh, uh, when you keep running, God will make it very unpleasant for you. Okay, some more lessons, four more lessons from Jonah, and then we'll call it off today. Number one, don't run away from commitment. No, don't run away from commitment. Don't run away from commitment. You need to learn to make commitment and keep your commitments. Don't run away from commitment. Just like Sunday morning, you know that's your time to come to church. Make commitment and keep that commitment. When you make a commitment to meet, uh, to help somebody, make that commitment. A lot of us, when somebody, oh, you don't want to make any commitment. Oh, I'm not sure. Let me get back to you. Okay, no. If somebody needs help, you can meet that needs. Make a commitment to help and keep that commitment. Okay, you with me? We need to learn to make commitment and keep those commitments, okay? So don't run away from commitment, okay? The culture teaches us to do exactly the opposite. The culture is telling us don't make any commitment, okay? But God is telling us we should not run away from commitment. We have to make commitment. John Maxwell puts it this way. Spot someone who runs from commitment and you will find a person who lacks character, Spot someone who runs from commitment, and you will find a person who lacks character. Uh, Rick Warren says the same thing. Making and keeping commitments builds my character. Making and keeping commitments build your character. Because what happens now? Once you make that commitment, you've got to be honest, right? And you've got to keep that commitment. But when you never make the commitment, it never gives you any opportunity to be honest, you're with me. Okay, we have to make commitments and keep commitments. Okay, just like if we need help with something, you need to volunteer. You just say, ah, oh, let me find out if I don't have anything. No, no, you need to make commitment and you need to keep commitments. It helps to build your character. It helps to build your character. Number two, there are consequences for avoiding commitments. There are consequences for avoiding commitments. There are consequences for us for avoiding commitments. It was clear from Jonah. Jonah refused to make a commitment to God and do what God told him to do, and God made it very unpleasant for him. See, running from God will cost you. See, remember Jonah paid the fare going to Tarshish? So it's kind of like he's paying the fare to go suffer. 
Okay? He paid the fare and still he didn't get where he wanted to go. Did he? See, that's the price a lot of us are paying. Okay, we, 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 we're running away from God, we're running away from commitments, and then we're trying to do our own things, and then it had great effects on our life, where it makes us waste more time than we actually had. Did Jonah waste more time? He wasted way more time instead of just taking that ship and go straight to Nineveh. But Jonah, uh, running from God, cost him time. Did it cost him his, uh, uh, some money? He paid the fare. Okay, a lot of us are running away from God. We're spending money and then we're just wasting our money. We're wasting our time. Do you think it affected his health? He was not in a good place. Okay, now you being thrown into the sea, I'm sure he drank some water before, the, before he got swallowed up. Right? That wasn't the sea. That water was what? Salty. So running away from God affects your time. It affects your money. It affects your health. It affects your peace. You think Jonah was at peace? And it takes away your joy. Are you with me? See, we need to learn to make commitment and keep commitment. And when we don't make commitments and keep those commitments... We are paying the price. There is a cost for not following what God tells us to do. And then here's the thing also. When we fail to make commitments to God, everything just goes down and down and down and down and down. See, it only goes down when you live a disobedient life. In verse 3, it says he went down to Joppa instead of going up to Nineveh. Okay, then it says he went down to the ship. And then Jonah gone down to the inner part of the ship and had lain down there. See, it just goes all the way down there. The text doesn't say that, but I just thought it was interesting that everything went down. Okay? So you with me. So make commitments and keep commitments. Remember, there are consequences for uh, uh, not making commitments. Number three, our choices or sins, our disobedience affect others and can be damaging to them. Just like Jonah's actions were damaging to the sailors. So it can be damaging to them. Uh, you see, we can remember Jonah slept through that very storm that God created to get his attention. So we should not become desensitized to the tragedies we have caused. A lot of us become very desensitized to the very thing that we have caused to happen. So our choices, our sins, our disobedience, they are damaging to others. Okay. I got two more. Uh, eventually, number four, we will have to obey. Eventually, we will have to obey. So we might as well start now. Don't you agree? Whatever you're not obeying God in right now, eventually you're going to have to obey. Or suffer the consequences. Okay? So why wait to get in such an unpleasant place? Whatever you don't obey God in right now, eventually you're going to have to obey. You with me? And then lastly, God can still use us if our impulse for obedience grows stronger than our reluctance. God can still use us if our impulse for obedience grows stronger than our reluctance. And we will see that at the end of the story. So in a nutshell, the message is simply this. I know you heard that word now, in a nutshell. That means you know I'm, the preacher is fluent now. Okay. In a nutshell... What I'm trying to tell you is that you need to be obedient. Be obedient to whatever God calls you to do. We will not always understand why God calls us to do certain things, but he does not ask us to depend upon our own understanding or logic. Remember that. He does not ask us to... Uh, depend on our own understanding or logic. Rather, he calls us to walk in obedience to what? 
He calls us to obedience to what? To his word. So don't make it necessary for God to inflict pain in your life for you to follow him. God loves you and he wants what's best for you. Amen. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for each one of us here this morning. Teach our hearts. Help us to be obedient. Help us to be more like you. Help us to walk according to your ways, not according to ours. Help us to learn from Jonah to be obedient today. Help us to be reminded we cannot run from you. We cannot run away from you. You are totally in control of all that we face. So, Father, help us to know and to trust you and live according to your ways. Not ours. Let me just speak to your heart right now. Let me just speak to your heart. As you still have your eyes closed, your head bows. It's, I just want to speak to your heart. You see, most of us are more like Jonah than we think. More of us are like Jonah than we think. Oh, we would be willing to admit Most of us won't commit to anything. I have some questions for you this morning. God says to seek him first. How many of you are actually doing that right now? How many of you are seeking him first? Let's do some self-evaluations. How many of you are actually seeking God first? God says to love others just as he loves us. How are we doing with our love for others? How are we doing with our love for others? God says to forgive others just as we have been forgiven. Are we as forgiving? Are we as forgiving? God says we need to encourage one another daily. Who are you encouraging on a daily basis in your life? Who are you encouraging on a daily basis? God calls us to be generous givers to his work and to the needs of others. How is your giving? God calls us to live at peace with everyone. Who are you keeping at bay? Who are you keeping at bay? God says to trust him with all our hearts. How are you doing with trusting God in every aspect of your life? How are you doing in trusting God in every aspect of your life? God says to share the gospel with unbelievers on a regular basis as we go. When was the last time you shared the gospel with someone? When was the last time you shared the gospel with anyone? God says to welcome one another and to outdo one another. When was the last time you invited someone to come along with you for worship? When was the last time you asked somebody to come along with you to worship? God says he wants his house to be full. Lastly, God says to be joyful always. 
Are you living as such? Are you living with joy always? The Bible says to pray without ceasing. How's your praying? How's your praying? Oh, Father, may we do all that you have called us to do. May we all live at peace with everyone. May we all be loving. May we all live with joy. May we all be generous. May we all love like you love. May we all be encouraging. May we all live in harmony and unity with one another. May we all pray for one another. And Father, help us to be obedient and trust you with all our heart. For you say trust in the Lord with all our hearts. Lean that on, your, on our own understanding in all our ways to acknowledge you and you will direct our, self, our steps. You say to delight ourselves in you and you will give us the desires of our hearts. Oh, Father, may we go today and live as such. May we make commitments and may we keep commitments. We love you, Father. As we study the series on Jonah, may you grow us. May you grow us into obedience. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Hello, guys. This is David from Bible Fellowship. Thank you for checking out this week's message on YouTube. If you live in Cleveland area, please come and join us. We would love to meet you. Also, please check our website, www.biblefellowshipcleveland.org. There, you can send us a message, share a prayer request, and subscribe to our weekly update. Please subscribe and share today's message to your friends and family on social media. And join us next week for more content. Thanks again for watching.